So maybe we can start with uh, Nicholas. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hello. Good afternoon again. Uh, my name is Nick Holliman. Uh, I'm a professor in informatics at King's College London. I'm also a Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, also in London, which is a, a national centre for AI and data science, where, among other things, I lead the Visualisation Interest Group, which brings together everyone in the UK interested in visualisation. And I, as part of my real job, I direct a centre called CUSP London, which is a data science and visualisation centre for data in London, and both in and analysed in London. Um, and my background is largely in stereo imaging uh, and visualization. I like drawing pictures. <laughs> so, hello everyone. So, I'm Yuichiro Fujimoto, an assistant professor of Nara Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. So, uh, today I presented a special augmented reality technology, but so I also like head mounted display. <laughs> so, um, my research interest. Uh, mainly more application side, so supporting system and training system using augmented reality or virtual reality. So I'm not so sure I'm qualified to be here. So, <laughs> And so unfortunately, I'm not so good at English. So if you talk to me, so please talk as if you talk to your children. <laughs> so, okay, something like that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm Ajit Nainan, and uh, uh, I am Senior Director at Meta. I run a few groups uh, doing applied perceptual science, image quality, and we have a perceptual uh, systems incubation team and a couple of other teams. And we work cross-functionally across the company uh, looking at all things imaging, basically. And prior to that, I was at Dolby Labs uh, working on AR, VR over there and uh, on high dynamic range displays and just display technology in general. My background is, you know, done a lot of uh, work in silicon uh, with video compression, networking, uh, so a lot of, uh, you know, image processing type stuff uh, through my career. And hopefully I can contribute in some positive way and not say I can't comment and for every question hopefully I can answer. <laughs> Uh, my name is Alex Shapiro. I'm a researcher at the intersection of computer graphics and vision science and applied vision science. In the past, I've worked at Disney Research Zurich um, in the stereo and displays group. I also worked at Dolby Laboratories in the applied vision science team and at Apple in a display incubation team. And today I work with Ajit at Meta in the applied perception science team. Um, and so my interests are uh, you know, heavily focused on uh, XR, you know, augmented and, and virtual reality uh, based on, you know, on, on Meta's uh, product lines and especially in how um, the human visual system interacts with those and how we can model and, and predict that. All right, so thank you, uh, panelists. And actually, I'm here, standing in front of you. Uh, I am Nico, by the way, and I'm the least distinguished in this um, <laughs> stage. <laughs> uh, and uh, by the way, I'm Nico Kaluya. I'm an assistant professor at Ritsumeikan University in Shiga, Japan. Uh, it's my first time here in Electronic Imaging Conference, and uh, I'm very happy to see everybody. Uh, my research interests are also augmented reality, but I'm leaning more towards like educational applications and like creative applications of AR and VR. So um, I'm, I'm mainly working with the students and, and uh, um, how, how to make sure that you know, we can use more AR stuff in our daily learning lives. So, yeah, so we, we have introduced um, uh, for today. So I think maybe we can already start with um, a very basic uh, question about like, um, yeah, what one interesting XR topic are we working on these days? So maybe it, this is a question for everybody in the panel. <laughs> yeah. Looks like it's my job to go first. <laughs> Um, so, I think I'm going to answer this slightly philosophically. So, um, what, what I'm very interested in is conveying information to people, and by people I mean everybody, not just technical scientists and specialists. Um, and, and at the moment, there's an information deluge, there's an automation deluge with AI, but there's very little information coming back from computers to people. 
And so I'm interested in how can we present very technical information to everybody, including non-technical people. Um, and I guess there's one example of that. We're working on things like uncertainty visualization, where we're modeling the flow of information using information theory from machines to humans and using that to invent new ways to present information in very structured, clear, and accurate um, ways back, back to people. Um, and we're very, uh, and we use as a backdrop to that, uh, we have things like a 3D city model of the whole of London. So we're trying to present information back in an engaging 3D way that people will react to and understand what's there, whether it's climate change or pollution or uh, our next big data dive is about mental health and how mental health relates to the urban environment. Um, so we're using that pipeline to work out how to get information to people um, and we want to engage them. Um, one of the things we know is bigger displays engage people more and if we can get people to interact with information on a large scale uh, as well as a small scale, they will start to understand and, and um, and perhaps act on that information. So if we give people information about pollution, they'll do something with it. If we give information about climate, they'll do something with it. And th that leads to my interest in displays, where if we can do it in stereo, people engage in stereo, if we can get 20 seconds more engagement in a climate data for people, that's good. If we have a head-mounted display, people are looking around, are trapped in the environment, they can't get out. But uh, they, they, they're trapped in a big screen display and they can see more. They can look around and use all sorts of, um, not necessarily interactive, but more natural ways of getting in touch with data. So I'm interested in displays uh, as a method of making sure that the things I want to convey in information streams actually get into people's minds. And hopefully the same thing gets into everybody's mind, not different things, as people like inventing variations on things. So that's my interest as a... As a engagement tool. Really. Okay, so uh, it might not be so appealing to this audience, but so I'm uh, very interested in the combination, how to combine the supporting system and training system using augmented reality. So uh, as you know, augmented reality is known uh, very useful for uh, various support, uh, supporting for various task in the real world, so like an engine assembling task or a PC maintenance task. But so on the other hand, so basically useful, so human being is tend to depend on the useful information. For example, if we think about the car driving, how should I say, navigation system, so uh, so every car has this kind of car driving navigation system. So uh, without this car si uh, driving system, I cannot go anywhere so anymore. I totally depend on, so hi highly rely on this system. So without this system, I cannot go anywhere. So it's due to the, how should I say, negative aspect of the supporting system. So uh, I am thinking how to combine the supporting effect. Uh, I define supporting system as the, how should I say, system increase, system that increase the human ability with this system. And training system is defined as the system that, how should I say, support human to develop their own skills after using this system. So I'd like to combine so these two things, training effect and supporting effect. This is uh, first one, and the second one is, so uh, I'm also interested in so the system that change the human perception. For example, so now we are working on the uh, system that change the perceived speed of the car drivers using augmented reality system. So user wears head mounted display like a HoloLens, and so now we are using a car driving simulator, and so visual effect like optical flow is displayed uh, through the uh, HoloLens 2. And so we revealed that these uh, visual effect surely affect the perceived speed of the car drivers. So uh, actually, so uh, 
how should I say? So chairman. So today chairman Nico <laughs> was working on this project when he was uh, a doctoral student in our laboratory. So you can directly uh, so ask him <laughs> if you are interested in so uh, something like that. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah. So what am I excited about in XR? I think I mean just fundamentally this is to me a a dawn of a new era in terms of how we interface with data, right? Spatial computing hasn't truly been leveraged because of the level of friction in order to use it. So if you think about in a phone, if you want to consume spatial computing data or any kind of data in, in a spatial nature, you have to, the only way to do that is with a pair of VR glasses, but then VR, because it's occluding, you can't leave the room or you, can just, you can't just walk around uh, in the environment because of the safety related to that. So the second that restriction goes and you're able to just wear this in, uh, all the time and you can interact with things and interact with, I mean, the whole uh, idea of everything that you can do with spatial computing changes the way we interact with that data. So, you know, the number of applications that would pop into... Um, uh, existence will be like insane, right? Because it's just the types of things that we can do. Uh, and, and the key thing that spatial computing does for humans is it augments humans, right? Uh, we've, we've had every type of device augmenting humans for, you know, generations. This is the next level of augmenting humans with a capability that we haven't had before, right? Low friction, uh, ability to access and, and interface with data in a very natural way, right? So that, to me, is the most exciting thing about this. And I think it's, it should be thought of as kind of like a, um, a you know, world peace, of course, first, right? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then we should start talking about uh, how do we get this technology in, into the world so that we can, uh, you know, have just a new phase of technology development and new way of uh, interacting with these types of experiences. Now, from an experiences point of view, what is the, the killer app, right? I mean, everybody keeps asking that question, but I mean, what, what can you not think of that can use spatial computing? I think every app that exists needs some, that there's some kind of a spatial computing aspect to it. Even maps, right? I mean, ma you look on your phone, it says turn left, turn right. I mean, if, if you have an arrow, like literally guiding you. That's some, the simplest version of from 2D to spatial computing application. And, and you can kind of see where it takes it. It takes it to a completely new level. And in, in the same way, you, entertainment, I mean, entertainment is going to evolve because the way you tell stories and things like that changes from this 2D flat plane to this volumetric, you know, immersive experience, right? Uh, and I, I, I've kind of done some uh, presentations in the past before at NAB ar around this, like what, what will artists do next, right? So that's th the other thing. So we have entertainment, we've got, you know, day-to-day -day applications, and then of course, just in general, like how do you use computing? How do you do your everyday tasks? Uh, you know, text messaging, remembering. I mean, I, I bet nobody remembers, you know, their spouse's phone number over here. Why? Because it's on our phone, right? It's literally augmented. I mean, back in my day and when I was a kid, I remembered everybody's phone number, um, but now I don't have to. So this augmenting human things is what's super exciting to me about XR. Yeah. Yeah. Or even the directions from home to work. Oh yeah, that too. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't go into work that much. That's <laughs> um, so f for things that are exciting in XR, I think I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more, more like research questions that I'm interested in and that I'm excited by. So the idea of having an immersive display where you can put it on and really feel like you're present in, in this, uh, you know, in a different environment that really feels realistic and immersive is something that for computer graphics, you know, has been discussed since Ivan Sutherland, you know, since the creator of computer graphics, <laughs> who also built one of the first, you know, virtual and augmented reality prototypes. So it's so interesting to see now that it's getting massive traction, like, can we really create these devices that everyone can use and feel like they're transported to, to somewhere else? But as a, as a person with an interest in vision science as well, there's this question of what would it take to really make it realistic and immersive? And these devices are so different from traditional displays. They have an extremely wide field of view. They can have a lot of contrast, right, with a controlled environment, but potentially you know, an HDR display. Uh, very fast movement speeds that are, you know, higher than traditional uh, traditional displays. You combine all those things and you get challenges, you know, optics. You get challenges that didn't exist before. 
Um, and you know, with, with this great sort of benefit comes um, a great deal of, of uncertainties and things that, that weren't you know, historically studied. So I think it's so interesting to create models that go across all the different aspects of vision that are involved in um, augmented and virtual reality. Um, for instance, like we just saw this talk from, from Bo in the, in the plenary with the contrast sensitivity model. It's a powerful model for vision scientists. And you know, these models need to be adapted and extended for them to properly work for virtual and augmented reality. So those are some of the things that, I'm, that I think are, are, are so interesting in this field to learn more about. All right, so we'll pick up on the, the question about the, what would it take to make it realistic and more immersive. So just to summarize everybody's points, like um, it's engagement, it's also support and training systems, world peace and AR, <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, uh, ad adopting some models. So I think maybe we can also just shift towards um, uh, another question, which is very um, connected to what, we're, what we've been discussing so far in this, ki uh, this day. So I will try to um, direct these questions to um, Alex and Ajit. So um, for me, uh, what are the key differences between XR displays and um, traditional displays? So uh, when it comes to first, image quality, and second, um, to modeling, especially you mentioned about like adopting to model, uh, adopting the modeling. Should I start? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I think some of the differences I've mentioned, so for example, like the wide field of view has mm -hmm. a big effect on a lot of our, our sensitivity. Like today I've presented uh, a, a small work on, on Flickr, but it's not just Flickr, it's all you know, temporal aspects of vision, uh, spatial aspects of vision, foveated rendering, all these engineering solutions that are necessary to make these devices work, um, you know, new challenges and then new solutions that exploit our visual system, right? Um, I think the question was more on specifically the challenges or, or, or what makes it immersive, right? Yes. So, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's much more towards... Um, uh, yeah, the differences so, so, between so, traditional and... Yeah, yeah traditional and the, the immersive um, XR displays. Yeah. Especially you, you had the Starburst uh, the prototype earlier, right? That's right. And one interesting thing, so, so say with Starburst, it's extremely bright, and so that's in, in a way different from, from most displays. But there have been displays that are very bright in, in you know, academic literature also as, as test beds for experiments. Like there was a Dolby display in the past that was you know, also very influential. But I think a key difference with, with VR is this immersive aspect and the wide field of view aspect, right? Um, and I think when you put on a display it, it, where it's head mounted and it tracks your movements, um, there's more to it than just an image that, that is kind of static in relation to, to your head. Um, there's really like a qualitative difference with, with how we perceive that display. And I think it's, um, it's interesting to study aspects of quality, preference, and even comfort um, in, in, that, uh, in that case, mm -hmm. which is totally different, I think, from traditional displays and uh, brings many new uh, challenges and, and benefits. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so the obvious one is, of course, you know, you're going from one display and you're both eyes looking at the display to two displays and both eyes looking at different displays and all the challenges there, but it's also opportunity for high optimization now. Right? A display that was in, sitting in front of you, light has to spray all over the room for you to be able to see an image. When you have two displays, sorry, I mean, I think you know, in the past I've been trying, I had tr been trying to build like a 10,000 nit display, and you know, everybody's like, "Ah, hey, you're going to need a nuclear power reactor to, to power that thing." Well, <laughs> why? Because the amount of light that you have to generate is for everybody in the room, even the people who are not there, right? So in this case, you can direct the light straight to if you. If you get a close enough contact lens, basically, you can direct only the light directly that's needed for that retinal you know, pixel, basically, right? That's the highest optimization. Mm -hmm. And with these two displays that are so close to your eye, now you also have other sensors and things like that that can get context from the viewer, um, you know, all the way from like eye tracking to uh, you know, every, every, every kind of piece of data that can highly optimize what you're presenting there, right? So it, it changes um, uh, the way we perceive an image from far away to close by, as well as from far away, it's a 2D image, making that 3D and volumetric, and, and light field displays are so much harder when you start bringing it closer to your eye. Now we start talking about the possibility, the realm of possibility is there, right? So it's definitely opening up new possibilities when you go from that static, display far away from you to something that's closer to your eye and eventually like in your eye, right? So, yeah. Yes. 
I mean, um, so, so just to uh, harp on the wide field of view one, of course, uh, I also, I'm interested also in like HMD and um, their, uh, ergonomic performance also, and, and also all, all of these kinds of things uh, that uh, look into, you know, how do people perform while they're wearing these HMDs. So I think for me, that's why I, I try to go to that direction because uh, like the first few iterations of the early HMDs that we have right now, like the past five, 10 years maybe, usually they try to do this. So whenever I see like my user studies, they always try to do this because of like the small field of view. And um, bringing up wide field of view is something that is very, very interesting. So um, maybe uh, I can extend that, this question from, from uh, the differences between XR and traditional displays. Maybe I can ask uh, Nicholas and Ajit for like what is common and what is also different um, for uh, XR content. Mm -hmm. And uh, like maybe let's say traditional content in, in the terms of like cinema or home theater experience. Mm -hmm. Maybe? Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Some instructions. Hello? Oh, oh. All oh. right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I didn't see this, this the hand signals in the back. So okay, okay. So so from uh, so, yeah, so from this place, we we move on to like content. So yeah, what are what are the differences this time around? Can I say yeah. Something? Oh, go ahead. Can I say something oh. about displays first? Mm -hmm. So so my test of a good XR display would be if I could see my 65-inch Sony TV in it at the same quality as in real life, because then I know it's working and my content won't be destroyed. So that's my first display test. Mm -hmm. but, and you can say something about content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so content, I mean, of course, there's, there's so many categories of content, right? So, um, you know, I, I think fundamentally, the nature of creating content and distributing content is gonna completely change, right? Um, you know, YouTube videos, they had codecs and things like that, all that stuff was designed for flat two-dimensional uh, content. When we start talking about three-dimensional content, you need something completely different, right? Uh, and then the types of content, you have short-form content and long-form content, and then you've got content that you're sitting to experience, and then you have content that you interact with, and then you have content that you walk around the room to experience, right? And then you have um, uh, static content that's just labeling things, right? Yeah. So all of these things are, are important. So the, the, the cool thing is the, the content types remain the same. It's just the way you're creating this content starts to change, right? You just have to start thinking spatially. And um, in, in the case of entertainment, at least I think it's going to be, uh, it, it takes a generation for people to let go of the past grammars and how they do stuff and adopt new things, you know, because uh, it's always going to, there's going to be some resistance to entering that new space. So, you know, I think the newer generation will adopt that sooner than uh, the older generation. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that, and so it, I think content is going to, go to go through a transition. It's not going to jump from one A to B. So you're going to get this like in-between experience for a while, right? Um, and, and the cool thing is, we can experience the existing content in the framework of this spatial computing. Right? It just means that where I put my 2D YouTube screen in space would be flexible, and it's, it's like a floating screen rather than a stuck screen on my hand or on my desktop, right? So, uh, so there's, there's compatibility issues is not that big a deal because we can start consuming content on day one on these new devices, right? So we don't have to have specialized content right away, right? So. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what's going to change, in my opinion. Nick? Uh, I think that's a good point. The investment in content is enormous. The cost of producing new content is enormous. Uh, and a new format that might not work out is a risk for anyone who produces that content. So if you can show the existing content, that gives you a starting point. And I think the thing I like about that headsets of all kinds is you can then take your 65-inch TV with you wherever you are. You don't have to carry it. That makes a, hu a huge difference. Um, I think the thing, so over 
10 years or so, I worked at Sharp, and we built 30 or 40 display prototypes. One of the ones that was a product you'll have heard of is the Nintendo 3DS, but we had several things, mobile phones and uh, uh, monitors and laptops in Japan that sold as products before that. The content production pipeline was king. The mobile phone we released had no content production pipeline, and to get images on it was hard, and content producers just didn't do that. It's the same here for this. And I think probably in the same way we hoped, you'll probably be hoping the gaming, gaming industry picks these up because they have the flexible spatial content. Even then, we found they didn't design content that worked and used the stereo cue. So we had to go to Sony and educate them on how to do that with their headset. So, yeah, content industry, you need the tools, the cameras, the systems, the standards you were talking about this morning, critical to get the standards out there. Yeah. But yeah, don't forget content. Yeah, I mean, the very interesting thing is, you know, at 3D movies before in the past, we'd go to these movies, and I, I mean, every time you come out of that movie, people would complain, right? Oh man, that that 3D was horrible. You know, <laughs> I haven't heard a single person talk, uh, complain about Avatar 2, the the new Avatar, yeah, because it was done so much better, and there was so much learnings, and then there's just the presentation of it, high frame rate, all that stuff just got fixed, and all of a sudden now. 3D is acceptable again in the theater, uh -huh. right? So it's like interesting that this is coming back uh -huh. because we've learned from the past and we're going forward uh -huh. to the future. And this is a perfect like transition. Uh, you know, we're probably going to get content on an XR device wrong uh -huh. uh, first, right? Uh -huh. um, you know, personally, I'm not a fan of 360 videos because there's no way you can pivot your head uh -huh. in. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's no center point. <laughs> yes. You know? uh, so I'm always a fan of six. Six off in, in, in content, you know. Uh, so, yeah, so we kind of already have made a few mistakes in terms of, like, presenting stuff that does make a few people kind of, you know, queasy, so we had to keep the content short. But as this problem gets solved, it opens up the door more and more content, more and more ways of creating content, so, and new ways of consuming content, for sure. Right, so like the waves is always going back and forth in terms of like the displays and the formats. Whenever, whenever I think about the, the the term like contents and displays, I'm always thinking about this song. I forgot this song. Video killed the radio star. <laughs> so yeah, so that kind of thing. And and even like in in, in my case, I think I, I I grew up my with my father reading a newspaper, right? And then like over like just the past three decades. I've seen him move on from the newspaper to radio to like the Walkman <laughs> and then just go more and more. And then now he's just like reading his stuff on uh, like Facebook for, for, for to get the news. So those kinds of things. And, and I feel like it feels like it's the same way with, with the way that AR, VR is evolving. So we're like just going on from just simple showing something, like showing a cube to right now, like doing on-demand content using v, uh, 5G and whatnot. So the, yeah, that's what, I'm, uh, what, that's what I'm looking at. But I think what is much more um, relevant to the AR, VR community, I guess, is the, this, these terms called Im immersion and like realism. And uh, we are always trying to you know, aim for that kind of level of it should be realistic. It should be like. Um, this augmented reality content is, is, is indistinguishable with the real world. So um, actually, um, that leads me to the next question. Um, what does it take for um, the XR content, or X, uh, sorry, X, XR displays to be more immersive and more realistic? So I'd like to um, direct this question to uh, Fujimoto-sensei and, and uh, Alex, maybe. Okay, so uh, okay, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not an uh, expert of display, so this is just uh, my opinion as a user side. And so uh, in, my, in our laboratory, so my um, most frequently used uh, head-mounted display is a uh, HoloLens 2, as you know, optical C3 head-mounted display. And so uh, one of the most important problem for now is that user can easily distinguish virtual contents with uh, real world things. So, yeah, of course, it's due to uh, several problems. One is, of course, the limited color representation. 
And the second is, of course, field of view problem. And the third one is a more unique problem on the special augmented reality. The effect of, of the background so effect. So as you know, so HoloLens 2, the uh, front, how should I say, display is a transparent. So user can directly look at the physical real world. And so the virtual content is, is always affected by the background, so information effect. So if the background intensity of the background is high, so user cannot see clearly see the overlaid information as well. Of course, so uh, there are a lot of uh, color calibration method and color compensation color compensation method have been already proposed. But so um, I don't think it's not. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it can be improved more. Mm -hmm. And maybe direct uh, solution is to physically occlude the background, so lighting, uh, using a shutter. So I had, for example, uh, Magic Leap 2 uh, provided this kind of physical shuttering function for dimming the light. I, I haven't tried it yet, but so yeah. This is the third one. And the fourth one, mm, vergence accommodation problems still exist. So yeah, we should. But uh, to be honest, basically, so uh, this kind of realistic, it's not so important for most cases. But there are several exceptions. For example, one exception is the research I introduced today. So I. Today, I introduced the special augmented reality technology for changing the appearance of the uh, color, uh, appearance of the f food. So uh, in this kind of system, I, I mean the system that would like to change the appearance of the real world. So yeah, these factors are very important and to be addressed in the near futures. Yeah, I think those, those are good points. Um, Okay, so when I think about a realistic and immersive um, display in, in virtual and augmented reality, one talk that I really enjoyed seeing on that was a plenary at EI from Doug Landman from a few years back, and he was talking about the visual touring display. So that would be a, a display, and in our case, maybe it's, it's an XR or you know, augmented or, or virtual reality display that is you know, indistinguishable from the real world. And he was talking about what are the steps, like the obvious steps in terms of display technology that are missing for us to get to that. And you guys can find that on that talk on YouTube. Um, and there's many things that are still you know, not quite uh, good enough for, to fool our visual system, like the resolution of these displays is, is still uh, below you know, what would be necessary. The dynamic range is still below what would be necessary. I think in the past, there have been some really interesting works in the literature, for example, on, on preferences for dynamic range coming from, from say, Dolby Laboratories, uh, specifically for cinema. And some of those we've, we've kind of replicated for virtual reality recently at Meta. Um, but similar preference ranges would need to be found um, you know, for, for all of these aspects, also for, for resolution, for stereo, and, and so on, uh, before we can have a display that really matches our, kinda, our desires to make things immersive and, and, and realistic. Um, I think there's one notable exception, which is Rafal has recently <laughs> built a display which, uh, it, through, through a beam splitter, you can a actually be fooled into uh, not being able to recognize a real object from a rendered one. And that's a very exciting development. However, as far as virtual and augmented reality, it's not exactly form factor. It is a, a table-mounted system that is quite large. And there's, there are some limitations in terms of the types of content that can be displayed. But I think that, that kind of research sort of opens the, the doors um, along with you know, the type of prototyping that's been done at Meta by, uh, by Doug's team to sort of understand what kind of display we would want to have that really fools us and gives us that realistic immersiveness. Very um, interesting points regarding realism. Uh, but here's the thing, right? Like we are talking about like augmented reality, virtual reality. These are like, you know, realities in themselves. So, so we always try to like bridge this, um, you know, uh, thing between what is real and also what is like not real or unrealistic. So I think um, with, with the way that we are always like looking forward to something more realistic or more immersive, um, is, it, is it still a, you know, a, a good aim to uh, look into the other side of it? Is there like a benefit to making it obviously, oh, it's not real? 
or can we go to the route of it looks abstract or it looks unrealistic in terms of XR content. So um, maybe I can direct these questions to um, Nicholas and uh, uh, Yuchiro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm trying to think through what that means. So I think that it is a mistake to think emotion has anything to do with VR or AR or XR. Okay. So they're not, emotion is a, a mental state, not a technology state, right? So you get immersed in a book. Books have words. They don't have high resolution 3D glowing pixels. So I, I think some of that's to do with the way that narrative is produced and the way in which you bring in narrative. And I think a lot of that's to do with the fidelity of the ideas that you're being transmitted, not to do with the fidelity of the display. And I think if you could design a system which was about idea transmission rather than light transmission and pixel transmission, you might get a lot closer to being immersive and believing in the realism of a scene without needing to have multi-trillion pixel display surfaces in, in your devices. So I think, yeah. Not that I wouldn't like them, but I think you don't need that to get a workable tool which will help you deliver information to people, a narrative to people. Okay, I see. Uh, so I'm talking about augmented reality things, not virtual reality things. So as I mentioned, so I'm also, I'm very, I'm working on various supporting systems using augmented reality. So uh, it, in my humble opinion, so realistic representation is not so important for most cases. For, for example, so let's think about engine assembling task. So user wears head mounted to display and the physical engine is here. And so next step, user should put these parts. These parts should be assembled here. So in this context, so the what user should know to, what the user should recognize is the position of these parts and the orientation of these parts. In this context, uh, I guess 3D wireframe is the best method because user can easily distinguish the 3D edge and the user can easily understand the position of the parts and how, so where to locate this object. So on the other hand, maybe the, if we use a realistic textured model, so user will be confused a little bit. And so sometimes, so user cannot have some difficulty of distinguishing real object and virtual object. It will cause a work, uh, so increase uh, workload. So yeah, so what I wanted to say here is, so uh, the appropriate representation, so totally depend on the, what we would like to uh, provide users. So yeah, we should consider about that point. Mm. I see. I, I mean, the, the, the way I, 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 I'd like to see it in this context is I always try to um, think about it in terms of um, the, the indistinguishable part. Sometimes I, of course, we, we, we want that for, for obvious reasons. Like we want, to, we want to make sure that this content looks as if it's the real thing. But at the same time also, I wanted I want it to, to be a little bit more obvious that, hey, this is what you should look at. So in terms of like other contexts, like um, changing the attention or, or, or moving towards this, this way, then maybe, or, or some navigation thing, then maybe um, a, a, little, a little bump or a little uh, diversion from like what is real maybe even be helpful for the users. So yeah, so that's why I'm trying to think of it this way. So, but uh, we've discussed a lot so far. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah we, have a, we had displays, we had like content, we had this um, immersion and realism, but I think um, this goes to all the panelists. So what is the most challenging thing in XR research? So I, yeah, we, we, with all of the things that we've discussed so far. Just one, just one. They give it to, to two meta guys, I guess they really want to. <laughs> I'll let him answer. 
Now, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll say one thing is super challenging, right? I mean, the types of content and the te technology access that we have today, uh, it's, it's a huge task to get everything fit in a, in a form factor, in a, in a structure uh, that allows you to use something the way you use your phone, right? Uh, the expectations of your phone uh, mm -hmm. have grown over the years to the point that if you don't get those types of functionality and uh, ease of use where you, you know, if you have to charge it every two hours or something, like that, it starts to become, Annoying. you know, like, oh, do I really want this, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, getting everything in that and to get the same quality I mean, it, that's that's a very difficult task. VR, AR, no matter what R it is, right? So, um, I'd say you know, number one uh, is you know, getting all the vendors, all the all the technologies, everybody, uh, you know, investing at the same level that you know some companies are investing would be really nice to uh, uh, to uh, overcome that, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, in in some areas, the research that we do are trying to compensate for the fact that we don't have all those things. So it becomes more and more imminent that you cannot brute force a solution. You have to highly optimize using perception and all the little games that you have in order to get to a product. So brute forcing a solution uh, can only fill the gap. Mm -hmm. uh, you quickly have to move to these like heavy perceptual optimizations in order to get to the target. Basically, that's what I would say is the, the challenge, right? How do you get uh, all these things done? Uh, in yeah, in a, in a and that's frame. why the keynote was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I totally agree with that, and I think there's even um, so, so this the form factor of the of the display because of the ergonomics of it because it sits on your face. It has to be really light, and you know with that, it's not just the challenge for the display, but even for the processing, right? So your battery is so small, your processor is is not so powerful. So you know. A lot of the time, we see like really excellent ideas being proposed, but n not being accounted for, say, the computational budget for implementing it, or you know, some things f for somebody coming from the computer graphics community, some rendering techniques that are very successful that definitely work and produce beautiful images, but are not applicable to this ultra low power, ultra light display type, right? So a lot of like even the graphics pipeline has to be sort of reinvented. Um, or you know, we kind of have to roll it back in terms of its of its budget by by many years. Um, Oh, but even the rendering technique, right? Even like, the rendering technique. Like you yeah. can't do full frame rendering or you know, whatever it is, everything. Yeah, or even like shading, ray tracing, all these things yeah. that you know we you know modern video games are, are using and they produce these beautiful images, but not really possible in these displays and, and potentially never will be. So um, you know it has to be kind of totally rethought completely with that specific display type in mind, I think. Yeah. yeah big big challenge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have to keep the order. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, so augmented reality is for human being. Always user is human. So uh, as, mm, I'm very interested in so how to assess the difference between the virtual contents uh, through the optical see through HMD, and so how much this virtual content is uh, similar as the uh, real. Uh, appearance. So, uh, I, so as far as I know, so I didn't find uh, the metrics for assessing uh, this kind of disparity. So, if you, so if someone knows, so I really would like to know about that. But so this would be very important uh, future work. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe a different challenge then. So a core part of my job is to communicate information about the world, uh, and particularly London, to the people in London. Um, so there's 11 million people in London. They're not all going to have a, sadly, are they? Yeah, going to have a meta headset maybe one day. Um, so how do people get that platform access? Do we use it in one-off things to engage people? And then the question is, where else can they see the same content? Have we got tools that are seamless across all the display platforms? And if you want a very mundane thing, I'd like Mathematica to have an output that goes into an XR headset without having to go through Unity and Blender and Photoshop and Lightroom and all the other things they go through. Um, because then my data analytics can go straight into headset and engage people. I see, okay. 
actually, I think the, the most challenging thing is passing the microphone <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> just kidding. Um, for me, I feel like, uh, for just to you know, uh, answer the question also, um, I've been doing some user studies during my master's and PhD days. And I always feel very, very tired after a long period of wearing it. So, so in, in my case, if we are still at that point of like form factor and you know, keeping, the, keeping your um, AR headset or VR headset secure, we, how long do you have to wear it? Or maybe, maybe I even thought of the question of like, how do we, if we cannot do it like on a 24-hour on a basis, like our like, um, eyewear right now or eyeglasses, when is the best time to, to, to use these kinds of things? And also, um, how, do, how do we plan the XR content or AR, VR content so that uh, you know, it, it will not yeah, be very physically exhausting to the person? Like, again, it's, it's part of that whole thing where you know, we, don't want the, we don't want the people to be sick because of that product, right? So I, I think uh, that that's the thing that I'm uh, like, work, like working on, especially in terms of like, if I want to do some AR in an educational context, or, or, or for example, like it's not just like the students, but anybody who wants to learn, how will they learn without having to think about the product itself or without having to think about, oh, it's very tiring to use this. I don't want to use this anymore. So I think that's the challenge. So um, I think uh, we have like, been going on, uh, like, going on through like, many different kinds of uh, topics. So maybe we can have um, a few questions from the audience. I maybe, so this is another pass the microphone. Um, activity. So we will just borrow one um, microphone and then we'll give the microphones to any, any of the people who would want a question. Okay. Oh, okay. Hello. Thank you very much for, for letting, um, yeah, sharing your thoughts. I, I just wondering what do you think on which uh, stage we are in terms, uh, like the answer should be kind of simple. Just imagine you have a billion dollar and you can split it between research on the headset or the development of the content and you know so you spend it to engineers or to artists and whom you give uh, more or you know how to split this <laughs> sure i mean i um i'm on the devices side so i said give us all the money <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll spend every cent. <laughs> no, I mean, it, you know, when when the device comes out, you have to have content, otherwise the device is completely useless, right? Yeah. So, um, I, I'm not one to say how you'd split the money, but uh, you would definitely cannot forget content, and content has to be relevant. It has to be stuff that people wants to consume. So, you know, um, yes, th th these types of things take time. So, I think. You know, building a good device is probably where you really want to invest a lot of the money. Um, but the platform is the next part. So that's not really quite content. So platform, device, those two things are kind of like the setting the stage for applications and content to be developed on. Uh, and if you remember, you know, the first iPhone came out, it came out with very few apps. Right? There were just a few things, but they were like very cool and fun to use and, and aesthetically beautiful and you know, a status symbol and you know, all that. Uh, but the device was kind of the center and the platform was the center. So I would still say those two are super high priority. And then we give that out to the, you know, the developers uh, to start creating content and, and incentivizing them to build that, that whole ecosystem of, you know, app stores and, and content creation and stuff like that. But you know, we should never underestimate content and remember that, you know, is this like money that I can just use for, do I get more of it next month or is this just like for? Just once. Oh, just once, oh, okay. Now that's harder. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, we have to budget something for that for sure. Since you say artists will pay for this stuff. Yeah, artists don't eat. I can take it. And 
Yeah. Yeah. Out. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> no, I'm kidding. You, 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 we are going to need these, you know, well-known artists for people to want to consume that content, right? So yeah, you, you do have to kind of uh, spend money on that as well. So yeah. um, because, like you, uh, like Nick said, basically the cost to produce uh, content is already really high, and then you take that and you multiply it by. I don't know, number of views of, that you have to capture, right? In order to make it volumetric, it becomes exorbitantly high. So, but we do need to like find a way to make that lower cost and, and start somewhere basically, right? So, um, yeah, and I would challenge the content con creation community to start thinking about these problems now, right? And come up with some solutions for that to make it scalable uh, and think past 2D basically, so. Hmm. Oh. Just okay. I can't speak to the to the financial portion of it, but I think um, it's interesting because I think just like the the display like like system like building just an amazing VR or AR headset isn't something that happens overnight and then you just have nothing and then you have the perfect solution. It's something that is kind of an iterative process. I think the content is a little bit like that too. So I think people may not be able to create like the perfect VR or AR experience or, or video game or app. Uh, you know, from one day to the next, there's learnings that go with it. Ju just like Ajit was mentioning. So. I think at Meta they say done is better than perfect. Uh, I think they, they, there's like something like that. So, in a way, you know, having the ecosystem already that already exists, for example, for Meta, um, already gives people an outlet to sort of begin iterating on it and, and begin producing content and and exploring, you know, that medium. Um, and so, hopefully, you know, over time, as the products, as, as the you know the devices develop, the content will kind of co-develop together with it and, and grow organically. I think that's the, I think that's the hope, right? Yeah. Done is better than perfect. Mm -hmm. Dissertation. <laughs> so I, I have an outlook question here on on uh, the development on, on the devices. So uh, I would imagine that uh, AR, especially, would be mainstream when you can have uh, the AR glasses uh, as um, easy to wear as normal glasses and looking cool like the sunglasses so and um, what do you think would be the when do we have that and and what would be the biggest challenge to to get to to that okay so <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, our our laboratory also working on so how to achieve uh, this kind of uh, barely thin, so lightweight uh, augmented reality devices. So uh, as I understand, so uh, the one of the problem is the current uh, most of the current head mounted d d display uh, is how should I say the IDF is problem. So IDF is the d d uh, distance between the human eye and so display panel, but if we use the normal lens. So we cannot shorten this eye relief so much. So maybe the one of the solution is that to use the lenslet array, very small lens. And so at first, so image is divided into very small regions. And so then, so converged to the surface of the pupil. So in this case, so uh, user can achieve the high quality image. And so we can shorten, much shorten the this idea, so then so we can create very lightweight uh, augmented reality display. But in this context, so the, there are some a lot of issues to be remained. So one issue is uh, so a crosstalk problem. So obviously, user is looking at a different position. So different light is coming from the user's pupil. Right? So then the two or three image mixed up, so user perceived the negative artifact. So this is called a crosstalk. So yeah, now we are trying to solve how to so alleviate these negative things. But yeah, something like that. Well, one of my PhD students used to work for Nokia in Finland, working on exactly that problem. And I think he thought the solution could only come from high quality, holographically recorded optical elements. It's the only thing that's thin enough. But whether they can be high quality enough, I think, is a different question. I think that's quite a challenge. Um, I think, and uh, I think I got, 
an answer to the previous question. Um, a, a different student of mine who's now sadly a banker, um, uh, he built uh, as a piece of unique content that would only work on these devices a game that you could only play in stereo. So he removed all the depth cues, lighting, shading, perspective, and left just stereo. So you had to have a stereo display to play it. So I think things w that demonstrate what, why you have to have some of these features would be quite good in the content domain. OK. Oh. Yeah, this is uh, maybe going to be more of a recommendation or suggestion. Um, so yeah, I went you know decades watching SIGGRAPH, um, and I'd always spend a lot of time watching the content uh, showcase, what the creatives were doing. And they're you know limited to three minute, five minutes or less. And about 90% of the stories, it's just really hard to tell a story in that short a time. 90% uh, of them were basically variations of um, Tom and Jerry or Coyote and Roadrunner. Character A getting the better of character B. So I think we're going to run through, go through the same stage here where the, the, a lot of content will be short. It'll be really challenging to do narratives. And even though we're engineers and the creatives may not listen to us, I would definitely challenge them when they come up with content of those simple-minded approaches. So just, just to give you a, a different example, Scott. Um, uh, we produced a three-minute film that made some of the people who watched it cry. The film was simply about pollution levels in the city center. Uh, and on a day when the city center was closed, there was no pollution. And they, could, they didn't normally see the pollution levels. When we showed how high above international limits it was, how low it was when all the cars and buses stopped, and how high it went straight back again, that engaged. So there's, there's, there's real world data out there that can engage people in things. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I come <laughs> from the same place you came from, and we interacted with the, the storytellers who needed, you know, a long, long time to tell stories. I mean, try to get James Cameron to make a short movie. It's never happening, right? Um, but at the same time, the company I'm at now, uh, short videos are like a focus and seems to engage people a lot. So the question is, how much of that short form video will they c c consume? Uh, if it was just mel multiple shorts, can you keep them engaged for longer? Um, that would be uh, the goal. And I think that, that it comes down to the science behind being able to wear a pair of glasses and make it uh, low friction enough so that they can wear it for longer. Uh, and I think it's, it's the, the issues that are there that's limiting us to the short form content, right? So if we, on a, from a perceptual point of view, can solve those, we can stretch the time for sure, right? So I think uh, a lot of science, again, once again, perception of you know applied perception and, and image quality and all of those things come into uh, play a major factor into how do we go from two minute, you know, 360 videos to I'm gonna watch. I mean, actually, you know, the the truth is Netflix and and all these other uh, pieces of content are being consumed in VR more than they used to. So there seems to be some sudden transition going on. But the headsets have been getting better. The experience is getting better. Latencies and all that stuff has gotten significantly better. So there's definitely a, 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 a trajectory in that path of like you're going to be able to don these things much longer. So, um, But at the same time, I think we need the studios to invest in these types of mediums. Uh, because they're spending all their money on the cinema content rather than spending money on this. They're doing experimental pieces, but we need some like big releases, right? Um, so yeah, definitely, I love that challenge. So yeah, it's got to move past. Uh, what did you say, Coyote and um, Minnie Mouse? Oh, yeah, Tom and Jerry. Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, we have a question over there, I think. So my question is about uh, whether users will be will ever be satisfied with the uh, uh, visual visual experiments out of uh, VR XR display because, well, I suspect that people will never be satisfied <laughs> with the uh, experience because to the flat panel boring displays always precedes the 
all kinds of display, and people are quite used to that kind of display, having 4K nowadays, 8K, and so on. Then the VR XR displays always has to sacrifice their uh, power or the um, resolution, whatever, to make it into compact and wearable. It's like, it's, it is like a laptop versus workstation. So people with a laptop always complain about the, its power, and it is natural, it, is ha it has to sacrifice its power for their compactness. So um, do you think the displays, the XR, VR displays will ever, like in future catch up with the, um, all kinds of other displays as we, well, as we experience in daily life, like you know, before human humanity will perish by <laughs> So, so it's interesting because, you know, so, so the medium of like those head mounted displays has a lot of limitations on like size and weight. So in a way, it's harder to make a display with high quality that way, right? But I think there are some parallels with say like, uh, like phones, right? So when phones came out, the displays weren't very good and, and maybe no cameras or, or, you know, initially some simple cameras. Compared to a DSLR, the phone camera, uh, you know, was, there was no comparison, it was much worse, right? Over time, phones are so much more common than DSLRs, like every, you know, almost everyone has a phone and DSLRs are, are much more rare. So the amount of effort that goes into making phone cameras is so much more that I think th there's now work coming out saying that the quality is comparable now between you know, the, the high-end phone cameras and, and you know, an average DSLR. Timo is not agreeing with me, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm citing work that perhaps exists or that I've seen somewhere, okay? So, <laughs> totally, but you, you can see, yeah. But so it's interesting that you, you know, even within that, that limited medium of the phone, people are, you know, because of the amount of effort and interest that goes into it, they can achieve great things, right? And same with the display of the phone. It's so good now, right? Um, that maybe it's even comparable to your home TV in some ways, perhaps not in others, right? So, so who knows? Maybe, you know, if, if AR becomes so popular that we're all using it, uh, maybe there will be enough interest that'll make that screen just, you know, uh, kind of progress by leaps and bounds and, and become really great. Um, so I wouldn't be so fatalistic as to say that it'll never be good. And the other thing is these things are always progressing. Even if it's a little bit behind something else, in principle, it could still um, be very good. So I don't know. I have a more positive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, one of your, your key things was will it be adopted? Because it'll never be as good as. But I think the, the key thing is what is the differentiator that will make it adopted, right? So uh, yeah. the, the yeah, like you said, the phone started off with a crappy screen, and then now it's got this amazing screen that looks, you know, in fact, it's the same resolution as your TV, right? Um, so it, it did catch up, right? But what, what was the main thing that allowed it to be adopted in the first place? Convenience, right? It's right there, low friction, pull it out, you make a call, you look at, you know, whatever, just the smallest applications, text messages that you didn't want to go to your laptop, open your laptop, and then type an email. It's just that, that high friction taken away, right, uh, with your phone. In the same way, glasses are going to reduce that friction significantly. So, you know, and, and like I said, augmented human, right? That's the big thing, right? So it's like, if I can augment you with a superpower, um, and, but it's not the greatest superpower, it's like, it still gives you a superpower. You'll take it, right? And, and even though you might be, yeah, you know, there might be some kryptonite that shows up every so often to weaken you, you'll still... Yeah, you, you'll, you'll sacrifice that for the one superpower that you, you have to adopt it. So if, if I mean, if AR, VR has that, that um, ability to augment you in some way and, and it's a continuous experience where it's low friction, I think it will still get adopted. And then eventually it'll catch up to where you're at. You know, in, in football, when you want to run, run the ball forward, you kind of have to, like hike it to the quarterback who's like five, 10 yards back before he throws it forward, right? So you gotta move a few steps back before you, you throw it forward. So yeah, I mean, I, I expect that. I think everybody should expect that, you know, as a, as a first step and then eventually it'll pass, right? So yeah. Yeah, really interesting discussion. Um, I would like to ask you, because I think 80% of the people here in the room would like to have to use these kinds of EXR devices by the whole world, but what would you say is from, I would like to ask you for the top three, but because we don't have the time, top, so what is your pri top priority in terms of target group? So that you say, I start from this target group, and if we got them, then we expand it to other target groups, for example, also especially from the perspective of Meta, but also I would like to ask it the whole panel. Okay. 
I'll, I'll let you guys start. <laughs> So w w maybe one of two types of influencer, possibly TikTok influencers or <laughs> Facebook influencers who will influence the world, or um, politicians who will set the frameworks for people to buy these things. Um, and if you can influence them to do that, then people will, will be able to use them. AR and VR becomes policy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, for us, it's very simple, right? Developers, we need to develop the platform and build it up. So people who are going to be developing things are probably the first people who should get these devices to, to get us to that killer app and that killer, you know, that feature, that, you know, what you think is going to be taking off, right? So, um, so this is, but this means you don't have a specific, from, this is more something at the software side who think about the target group. It's not so much your business in a way. Yeah, I mean, eventually the, 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 the goal is you know, mass adoption, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, of course, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's, but I, I mean, normally you start, you say, okay, this is my main group, and then when I got ah, them, I will expand it. I see. Yeah. yeah, I can't comment on exactly what we're thinking there, but I'll say that the developers are probably very important to us, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, just to add to that, for me, my bias is always students. So, so if we can have like that starting point with the students, then maybe we can expand into like a general learning scenario for like all age groups, me even. So, if we can have that, then maybe you know we can we can help grandma use um, like AR, or maybe we can also try to think about actually making um, making AR more suitable for like maybe children. So, or, or, or are there any kind of like safety things that we need to consider? So we start first with like people who understand the, the technology or are actually um, mature enough to, to know about it. Then we just go away from that. So, but, the, but it's my biased um, opinion. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, there, there were hands earlier, so okay. Um, yeah, just a quick comment on, on the uh, being able to catch up with the regular 2D display panels. So the, uh, you know, the, the XR will be able to do foveated rendering. So that uh, theoretically should allow it to surpass, uh, at least when you consider the full signal that needs to be sent. But my question was going to be, um, so back around, well, I guess you would call it the Avatar 1 era of uh, 3D. <laughs> um, so this guy at SID, era Silzars, um, talked a lot about the artificiality of uh, the current stereoscopic 3D. And his big theory was that you didn't have physiological tremor. So the head's always moving. You can't hold anything you know, perfectly still. And then the idea is with each little tremor happening, very small amounts, high frequency, that you're seeing new uh, perspectives and views. And the stereoscopic 3D didn't have that. And he, that was his big theory of why it looked art. It looked 3D, it looked cool, but you, you weren't you know, tricked that it was reality. It looked, had artificiality about it. So with HMDs, I guess, how good do you think we need a model? Head movements, um, is this physiological tremor theory something to pursue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, this morning I kind of I did a presentation in terms of like, um, you know, what we need to overcome in terms of a minimum viable product. Um, but the key thing over there is minimum viable product for what application, right? So that ties in very closely with the application. So um, one of the things that we do study is world locking error, like you're talking about. It's probably going to show up because of the tremor and not being able to uh, to track for that. But there's a lot of applications that don't need to address that and still be usable and still be a very functional device. Uh, so, you know, at what point do we want to, I guess, the, the ultimate goal is the visual touring test, which means that we've got to get to that point at some point. But uh, for the first step, I mean, I don't see that as uh, a minimum viable feature for, um, you know, I, I don't know if that will be the number one cause of motion sickness, but that's something that I've asked people, like we gotta study that. Is that one of the causes of motion sickness and, and the, the ability to wear it? We, we gotta, as a community, study that and come up with, um, you know, what I would like is the, the whole uh, community to 
figure out what is the minimum viable product for each one of these applications in order to be able to uh, deliver a pleasing experience. Uh, you know, so we're not doing just heads up displays uh, to, you know, because every, every possible solution has to be solved before we ship something. It's not going to happen, right? It's just, you know, and then if we do that and we just boil it down to something so simplistic, then it's just going to be heads up display stuff, right? Which I don't think is, I mean, then, then, then the superpower problem that I was talking about, it's not enabled over there, right? So we really want that mixed reality, spatial computing, labeling. And we want to make space, uh, like I want to be able to sell this spot right here in front of my face. <laughs> in, in AR world, for, for for you know I don't know one Bitcoin or something, <laughs> but <laughs> but I mean but but basically I think different applications are gonna need different things. So that's definitely on the list of things to solve for sure. Um, but in I'm not sure for me if that's like on the top of the list to solve first, right? So yeah. All right. Okay. the um, socio-technical problem of uh, trust, uh, which you reminded me of when you said selling advertising space in front of my face. Uh, as soon as you start tracking people's eye movements and tracking people's head movements and tracking what they see and look at and consciously or otherwise prefer to see, uh, I think you've got a, so, a political and socio-technical problem. And that's probably a, a, a challenge ahead too. All right, so I, I saw a, a hand on this side. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, <laughs> just, just a small, s s uh, small I don't know, comment or s something like that, because you said about this friction a couple of times, but the friction with wearing a hat, it's really a lot. Mm -hmm. And especially the moment you cut off from, from the outside world completely, so I would really go back and finance artists much more and software to 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 make the thing that I can wear it and then can I can still interact with the with the existing world around me and just extend it to something more and and then this would be yeah in much much more important in my opinion even than making it really perfect well let's see <laughs> It's actually a good segue. I want to add to that. It's like it would be great to support, for example, social scientists to figure out how do these new technologies affect our society. Like you, you, you hinted at that and several times. We, we got to this direction already, but it's like uh, we've seen how mobile phones have changed how we interact with each other. Like go to Bart, uh, the, the subway here 20 years ago, and then everyone would have with a book or would talk to each other or something like this. Today, everyone is just, everyone is staring their device. And with an HMD, it's, it's, it's one step even further. It's like you really make yourself cocooned in into a, into a device. How, how would that going to change? And, and are you, for example, following up? Is there an uptick in, in research in, in social sciences or so just to, to kind of look how we use those devices that in, in turn can influence how app designers uh, develop their stuff or how your company in a certain way develops how they, they, they monetize on it or, 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 and other companies obviously it's not, not just uh, one company but I think it's a valuable lesson for our society to think about that stuff. Yes. <laughs> I'm very succinct. <laughs> so yeah. Just on friction, the I wear these all day, every day. I don't see it as friction. It gives me something in the world that I can't live without. And I think if you have AR, MR displays like this, I'll be very happy. Yeah. But as you said, it's very far from that. Well, it's not so far off. Nokia are quite close. So yes, <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we are uh, at the end of our um, panel discussion. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, everyone for participating in, uh, in this session. And uh, most especially, I would like to thank all of the people who are in the stage today uh, for uh, sharing their valuable opinions and also um, their knowledge to everybody. 
So with that, I conclude this um, special session on ARVR. Um, I think we need to be back in 10 minutes, I think, for the uh, so the end of the day discussion. Oh. Oh. Magically. <laughs> and <laughs> it's been augmented to this room. So yeah, uh, <laughs> so that would be the next end of the discussion. Can you remind us about the banquet, where it is, what time? So the banquet tonight is at 7 p.m. We're very lucky to have you know, the invited speaker. And the room is it's in the hotel. I'll have to double check. Mission one. So, if you want on this floor, you are past the elevator and just swing around the hall and keep going. You'll see it. Mission one. Okay. And the door will be open once we are. Yeah, so that starts at 7 p.m. All right, so um, I think that's it for um, this panel discussion. So um, let's give a round of applause to our panelists.